Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer. As ever, I am your host. And this week, we're bringing you a little bonus episode. Uh, Very excitingly, this week sees the re-release of a 4K restoration of one of the most important horror movies ever made, Michael Powell's Peeping Tom. It's actually been released on the big screen, and there's a beautiful new 4K Blu-ray release. Now, this is a film, as you all know, I'm sure, that was not very well received when it was first released. In fact, it completely bombed. Critics tore it apart. The film basically disappeared into obscurity and the director, Michael Powell, his career was basically ruined because of it. Only over time was this film uh, finally appreciated by audiences and critics and filmmakers. And one of the most instrumental people in spreading the word about Peeping Tom, in bringing it to film festivals, in showing it to audiences, was the filmmaker, Martin Scorsese. Martin Scorsese often cites this as one of his favourite movies of all time. In fact, I believe it was him talking about it that led me to first seek out the film and give it a watch. Now, Martin Scorsese has a long-term collaborator, somebody he's worked with since Raging Bull in 1980, his editor, Thelma Schoonmaker. Uh, Thelma Schoonmaker is now somewhat of a legend. She's 83 years old. She's a three-time Oscar winner, and she has edited every single Scorsese film throughout his career from Raging Bull in 1980 all the way through to this year's The Killers of the Flower Moon, his spectacular new movie, which is also in cinemas right now now. And Martin Scorsese and Thelma Schoonmarker were instrumental together in creating this 4K restoration of Peeping Tom. They're also currently working on a documentary about Michael Powell and Peeping Tom together. Uh, Scorsese introduced Thelma to the cinema of Michael Powell, and he introduced her to Michael Powell, the filmmaker, in the early 1980s, and she ended up marrying director Michael Powell and was with him until his death in 1990. Now, all of this is very important background information before I introduce my guest, one of the most exciting people I think I've ever had the honour of sitting down and interviewing. I got to chat to the Oscar award-winning editor, legend of cinema, Martin Scorsese's longest collaborator and Michael Powell's widow, Thelma Schoonmarker. I sat down and chatted to her about Peeping Tom, about its legacy and about her career to date. So please enjoy my interview with the brilliant Thelma Schoonmarker. Mark, what do you do? I work in a film studio. I hope to be a director very soon. What's going on here? Murder. All this filming isn't healthy. A big welcome to Thelma Schoonmarker. Hello, Thelma. Hello. Hello. Um, How's your London uh, trip been so far? Oh, fine. We've had some wonderful reception of the celebration of Powell and Pressburger. And I mean, the the tickets have been selling and it's really great. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, obviously, this is very exciting that we're getting a 4K restoration of Peeping Tom. Tell us a little bit about kind of your involvement in this process. Well, I've been involved in the restoration of almost eight, I think now, Powell Pressburger films. Of course, Peeping Tom is only a Michael Powell film. It's not an Emmerich Pressburger film. But, uh, and it's a, it's a beloved um, job. I, I just adore it. And of course, as a film editor, I'm very aware of how to color time and density and all kinds mm. of things that are involved in filmmaking. And here, just to see a film come back to life uh, because it's being restored has, has been a, a great joy. And I also love seeing, you know, when we're timing these films, we we watch them over and over again. We, we watch a certain scene, we're trying to get the color exactly right, and uh, you watch it over and over again. And I love that. Um, the Powell Pressburger films I never get tired of. I could watch them over and over again. Um, and that's a great compliment to them. Uh, and uh, so now also what I find is I, I start seeing beautiful camera moves and things that I hadn't seen before because I was taken by the story, you know? Yeah, yeah. So you And you see little details that they've put in the film that you do. You're, they're affecting you, but you don't actually 
focus on them, but mm-hmm. when you see it over and over again, you do, which is great. Of course. Yeah. What's your history with Peeping Tom? Do you remember the first time you saw the movie and, and what was your reaction to it on that first watch? I didn't see it until quite late, actually. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, I would imagine during the period that Scorsese was teaching me about Paul Pressburger films, I would think, hmm, I wouldn't think it was until maybe the 90s that I saw it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, you know, I was stunned by it, of course, and deeply affected by the way that Michael Powell wanted to inject compassion into the film for someone who's been tortured as a child and and can't stop, can't help what he's doing. Yeah. Um, and the beautiful performance of Carl Boehm as Mark, which is, and, you know, I think the performance by uh, Carl Boehm, which was, of course, carefully directed by Michael, um, is the reason that the critics flipped out because mm. you were feeling compassion for him and they couldn't handle that they thought well he's a serial killer so yes. <laughs> how can i possibly be feeling compassion of course that nowadays many films are made that way yeah and there was one made much earlier in germany called m that's right with yeah. peter Lorre. yes and uh so i think that they just felt they were they were feeling so guilty mm. about their compassion for mark that they wanted the film destroyed. That's why they wrote things like it should be flushed down the toilet. I've never read such horrible reviews in my life, which were gathered together by Ian Christie, great expert on Paolo Pressburger. And um, however, what Ian also later looked into is that the trade reviews were not bad. Mm. Uh, The critics were horrendous. I mean, they they just hated the film. However, Dillis Powell, one of the most famous critics ever in Britain apologized to Michael Mm. 20 years later uh, in a newspaper. She said, I was wrong. I'm sorry, Mm. which was, and Michael was still alive, which was great that he saw that. So uh, I think that Michael said to the Anglo amalgamated who made to produce the movie, don't yank it from the theaters. Let people see it. Maybe the critics are wrong. Maybe people will respond to it. Yeah. And I think he was right, but they wouldn't listen. They just yanked it and they sold it to a porno house or something like that. Yeah. They just dumped it. And Scorsese, many years later, entered it into the New York Film Festival in 1980, I think it was. And um, it was a huge hit. Yeah. And Steven Soderbergh was there and, of course, his film as uh, Sex Lies on Videotape is obviously affected by it. And uh, Francis Coppola was there and was knocked out by it. So, um, And then Marty actually got it redistributed mm. in, in America very briefly by some brave film distribution company, and then it vanished again. And now it's going to be, as of today, in the cinemas again, which Fantastic. I wish Michael was here to see, because he's, he was right. I'm sure that if they had allowed people to see it, yeah. It might have survived. Yeah. yeah. What were Michael's kind of, you know, because obviously it had such a, a negative impact on his career too at the time, right? Didn't it? The way that film was treated. How did, how were Michael's kind of memories and feelings about that film from your experience? You know, did he well, still kind of think fondly upon the film itself? Well, he knew from having worked with uh, a great Irish American director named Rex Ingram in the south of France, where he first learned to, to anything about filmmaking. He had seen Rex Ingram's uh, reputation uh, destroyed by a producer, a famous producer, Louis B. Mayer in, yeah. in Hollywood. And uh, they, t- they tangled all the time because Mayer didn't like Ingram's brilliant artistic ideas. And so unwisely, um, Rex Ingram would leave off the word mayor in Metro Golden Mayor mm. on his movies, and Mayor destroyed him, and he never made films again. And that was very painful for Michael. So he had, he had seen somebody go out on the limb and be sawn off, and that's what Michael said. If, I'm, if you're doing something daring, you're out on the edge of the limb, and you can be sawed off. But for Michael, he said, it's better for me to be sawed off than to be conventional. Yeah. That was very much in his mind. So he firmly believed in the film. He never gave up his belief in the film. Never. 
uh, Carl Burham, when we would have dinner with him, sometimes he would come to London. He just never got over it. Mm. He just kept saying, what was wrong? Why didn't people <laughs> understand? I mean, yeah. you know, and uh, his chorus performance is beautiful. Yeah. And um, But Michael knew the risks of being ahead of your time, and he was way ahead of his time with this movie. He was. <laughs> way ahead. Way like 20 wait. years or something, yeah. Exactly. It's interesting as well, it came out in the same year as, as Alfred Hitchcock's yeah. Psycho, of mm. course, right? And, mm. and in some ways, they have, similar, they have similarities there. Obviously, very different reactions. Why do you think Psycho was so embraced by critics and audiences in comparison? Well, Hitchcock had a phenomenal reputation at that point, yeah. so any people would go see any Hitchcock film, I think. But... I don't think that you feel the same way for Bates uh, in that film as right. you do. That that was the difference. I think mm. you were allowed to say, oh, this is a villain. But in Michael's films and in Marty's films, there's never a villain and a hero. There's someone in between, yeah. like most human beings. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it was easier to accept Psycho, which is actually much more violent yes, than anything, more. anything in Peeping Tom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you hardly see blood at all on Peeping Tom, maybe just at the very end. But uh, yes, I, I think it was a combination of, and it was a um, titillating, yeah. uh, big word of mouth, you know, oh, you've got to go see this. Mm. But Michael didn't have the same stature i think he should have but i mean powell and pressburger at that point had been thrown out you know they just said oh these are old-fashioned films so he didn't have the power that hitchcock had they remained friends by the way till the end of michael's life whenever he went to la he would always have dinner with hitch and his wife that's amazing yeah, do, yeah. You, do you think hitch would would did he did he appreciate peeping tom would he stick up for it do you think that i don't know no. I've, I've been asked that question i really don't know no. Um, Michael has not documented that. Mm, yeah. Mm. Um, we, speaking of Hitchcock as well and Psycho, you know, you've got that kind of very iconic shower scene. And again, I'm, I'm keen to ask you as an editor, are there any particular moments in Peeping Tom that kind of uh, are kind of real highlights for you in terms of just the sheer craft and filmmaking um, of execution? Well, there's marvelous uh, camera work in Peeping Tom, which again, I wasn't as aware of. Yeah. Until now, I've seen it over and over again. I, I can. There are shots that are brilliantly carried out by this wonderful cameraman Otto Heller, mm. uh, and with Michael designing it, of course. But I don't think no. I, I Michael wouldn't have known the cutting there. It was a big influence on Scorsese in Raging Bull, mm. the bathroom uh, scene, yeah. yeah, which was heavily uh, designed by Saul Bass, the great title designer, who. Yeah. You know, when we started having big opening title sequences at a certain point, um, and Marty was looking for both a new composer and a title designer, somebody in Hollywood said, well, you know, there's Saul Bass and, and Elmer Bernstein, but they're very old. <laughs> and Marty said, you mean I can hire them? Their work is so beautiful. Can I really... And and so they worked with us for years, yeah. and it was heaven working with them. Saul was very instrumental in that shower scene. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have any particular favorite moment of Peeping Tom? For me, the ones that are my favorites are the ones that show the vulnerability of Mark. And mm. I showed last night a clip at the NFT of uh, where he's gone out on a date yeah. with Anna Massey, who lives in the building that he owns and rents out to boarders. Mm. Um, and she has convinced him. She has no idea that he's a killer. Mm. Uh, she, But she, you know, Michael said, Mark is, I think he said, um, attractive, gentle, and sweet, and completely mad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and that is... What she doesn't understand, she's a, she's responding to him being attractive, interesting. She wants him to make photographs for a children's book she's writing, and they they have this wonderful beginning of their relationship because they live in the same building, and she sort of forces her way into his world. But he's not used to relating to people other than as a focus puller on the set. Yeah. So she convinces him to go on a date. Yeah. And they go for dinner, and she says to him beforehand, why don't you leave your camera behind, which he's never without. Yes. <laughs> and he very agonizingly 
gives her the camera and she puts it in her room. And when they come back, they've had a lovely evening. And she says, it was a wonderful evening, Mark. And he says, yes, it was. Mm. And she says, and you left your camera behind. And he said, yes. Uh, and she goes to get it. And she turns the camera on herself. She says, what does it look like if you... And he rushes over and says, no, 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 not you, not you. Yeah. I always lose the people that I film. And she then kisses him. And he responds, of course, to that. And then he turns the camera around and kisses the camera. Mm. And Scorsese, when I showed that we were trying to choose a section for this documentary we're making about Paul and Pressburger. And um, I showed him this as an option, and he said, oh, I love that, that he kisses the camera. But yeah. we, chose, we chose another sequence, and while I was showing him that sequence, uh, which is where Maura Shearer has been killed, and he's watching the dailies mm. and gets very upset because the lights went out too soon. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, and uh, Mike, Marty just started shouting out in the room with me, look at the filmmaking, look at what he's doing, look at that, because he was so impressed by how Michael had shot that sequence. And um, so that's the kind of thing that, for those of us who've now spent a lot of time with the film, you begin to notice more. Yeah. yeah. The film also seems like such a brilliant, I guess, almost satire of the, the film industry and, oh. that, and that real obsession, right? You know, and I think there's some funny, there's some funny oh, commentary the, in there, oh, isn't oh, there? Oh, the, the, the incredible, Rafa, he loved making fun of the film, of the of the the studio bosses yeah yeah who had ruined him after you know red shoes they hated jarrett rankin john davis hated the movie which became one of the all-time box office uh grocers ever i mean compared with oppenheimer it's well. way to, but it's on the variety list yeah. and they were wrong jarrett rank and john davis were absolutely wrong they had left them alone for the entire period of the war and for black narcissus and they had left them alone, but this, they just could not handle the red shoes. And so it was devastating for, for uh, Michael and Emmerich, and they went to work for Alexander Korda. So I think the people he's making fun of in Peeping Tom are the people who didn't like red shoes. Yes. So the, the studio executive is named Ron Jarvis, which is an anagram of John Davis, <laughs> one go. of the people who ruined his, you know, help right. to tried to ruin Peeping Tom, uh, sorry, excuse me, tried to ruin Red Shoes. Mm -hmm. Red Shoes was saved by two Americans, Arthur Krim and Bob Benjamin, who said, let us take a chance with it. It ran for two solid years in yeah. New York City in one theater, two years, and then it became a worldwide hit. Mm -hmm. um, but so he loves making fun of the stupid bureaucratic ideas yeah. um, and... The, you can see that he's been on the phone with people in Hollywood or wire or some, you know, strange electrical thing they've set up so he can talk to people in, in Hollywood, which the time difference is so great. It's probably, you know, uh, impossible time anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, he loved making fun. <laughs> and there's also that commentary on the kind of, I guess, the, the obsession, the absolute obsession mm, mm, behind filmmakers. Mm. Is there truth in that? Do you think, Thelma, from your oh, experience? Oh, yes. I mean, and even Scorsese says, yes, it's about, you know, the impulsive urge to, to, to view, to look. Yeah. And, of course, an actor like De Niro does that all the time. When he's out walking on a street, he's observing people. Mm -hmm. That's part of his job. Yeah. And so, yes, I mean, all of us who are filmmakers, we become addicted because it's such a wonderful, creative, challenging job. And you... you spend a long time making this work of art which then is thrust out into the world it, it's wonderful and it sometimes you know it can damage your family relations it can damage your friends because they don't ever see you my friends are very patient they wait for me <laughs> um but uh and there are other ways that filmmaking is destructive can be destructive yeah but it is so addictive as you see in the red shoes you know yeah. that uh Actually, Michael says in an interview on the South Bank show that David Hinton, who's directing the documentary we're making now and who did a beautiful, beautiful documentary on Michael, um, at one point he's asked, and why did she have to die in the red shoes? And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Michael said she's dying for her art. And um, 
I would do that too. And the, the interviewer says, is taken aback. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 That idea as well of the film kind of being so ahead of its time and it taking that kind of that, you know, 10, 20, 30 years to be fully appreciated. Do you think there's anything that you and Scorsese have worked on together that you felt was kind of almost too ahead of its time that took that wasn't necessarily appreciated immediately and then now is? Oh, well, Raging Bull did not do well when it came out, you know. Right. It took 10 years for Raging Bull to be recognized for what it was, which mm-hmm. is a unique piece of groundbreaking filmmaking. Yeah. It w- it took 10 years. Uh, I'm not kidding. I mean, yeah. Marty's early films, because they were so far ahead of the time, um, were not box office successes, mm-hmm. except Taxi Driver, I think, was. Yeah. Taxi Driver was. Uh, but it took a very, very long time. I remember times when I would say, People would say, what do you do? And i say, I work for Martin Scorsese. And they would say, who's that? I mean, they had wow. no idea. Yeah. yeah. And now, of course, he's <laughs> fortunately getting the accolades he deserves. Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, is acknowledged as a groundbreaking director, even with Killers of the Flower Moon. It's a very unusual movie. And, um, but it took a long time. So I, I, think, I think, in a way, Marty's knowledge of how much Emmerich and Michael suffered mm. was something that he could identify with because yeah. he had to. He had a very hard time in Hollywood in the beginning trying to sell his ideas. Mm. For example, Goodfellas, he couldn't sell it. And uh, the studios kept saying, you have to take the, the drugs out. And he said, I can't take the drugs out. That's the story <laughs> yes. of the movie. And I was working with Michael on his helping him with his autobiography one Sunday, and I was telling him how upset Marty was, and he said, read me the script. So I read him the script of Goodfellas, because he he could see, okay, but he couldn't read very well then. And he said, get Marty on the phone. This, and he got him on the phone, and he said, Marty, you have to make this movie. This is the best script I've read in 20 years. Mm -hmm. So Marty went back in and got the movie made. So Michael really, was responsible in a way, and mm. then he didn't live to see it, unfortunately, oh. which was too bad, yeah. I'd love to just quickly ask you about, about horror cinema, too. Um, you know, I'd love to ask you, as as an editor, Thelma, what do you think is the, is the secret to kind of really pulling off an effective horror sequence or a, a really effective scare in that regard? Well, I have to tell you something. Yeah. I don't think it's a horror film. <laughs> uh, Peeping Tom. I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't think Michael ever intended that. And he certainly, I don't think, while people say it, kicked off the slasher film and everything. Yeah. I, I don't think Michael would be happy about that, frankly. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry to say that, but I think the film will do well in spite of my saying that. Um, it's not, that's not why he made it. It was, it was about the compulsive urge to gaze. That's what scoptophilia is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and how he could uh, make fun of the film industry and also give this very complex portrait of of a person mm. because you know there aren't our heroes and villains in in either Michael's movies Michael and Emmerich's movies or Scorsese's no. there, it's something in between that interests them so i do not go to horror films i've never seen one really um, no never uh, wow and i don't think michael would either uh, what, what about do, do you think anything that you and marty have made together would would be classed as what about shutter island that's that's a horror movie no? well yeah i mean marty's films have violence in them yes mm-hmm. i mean because he grew up in a violent world you yeah. know where uh if you were playing out on the street in little italy the the word would go around to the parents to say, get your children off the street at two o'clock. Yeah. That's because there was going to be a murder there. Yeah. And then the kids would go back out to play. So he grew up around violence. He understands violence. Um, so uh, I, I, I think of many of his films, I mean, Raging Bull is very violent. Yeah. Uh, and the, but not so much recently. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's much more downgraded. They're different. They're different topics. You know, silence is a different topic. Um, Absolutely. And uh, killers is something, too, where if you notice all the murders are in wide shots. They are. Yeah. I noticed yeah. that as well. But um, I, I, I think Marty is more of a horror fan than, uh, horror fan than I am. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm not at all. <laughs> but I think Peeping Tom is a wonderful movie. Go see it. Oh, everyone go see Peeping Tom, of course. Um, that's really interesting. So you never approached Shutter Island or even Cape Fear, for example, with the, with the mind that it was a horror movie in that regard. 
Never. No. 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 Yeah. It was it was part of it, but that's all. You know, and, and it wasn't horror, it was real violence. It was real every day. Yeah. Uh, particularly in America today. Yeah. I mean there's a shooting almost every day. It's just horrifying. Yeah. Uh, but uh no, it, it's it's part of it, but that's not it's not created as a horror film. Sure. Yeah. Um, let me just finish by asking you about the wonderful Killers of the Flower Moon as well, mm. and it's been doing so well. Oh, you must be so yeah, pleased. It, um, and tell me a little bit about the way it, you and Marty kind of approached this one in the edit, because again, it feels a little bit like there's a little bit less. Um, the editing seems a little bit more subtle, I suppose, maybe than something like Wolf of Wall Street, for example. Mm, well, it's quieter. It's, quieter it's, yeah. it's, yes, it's it's. Uh, more sobering, you mm. know, and we wanted, certainly Marty wanted to uh, let people really absorb characters. So yeah. sometimes the editing is slower than our other movies mm. for that reason. And I think people do absorb the characters. And, yeah. and then the idea of sometimes not having subtitles when you hear Osage spoken, or you hear DiCaprio, who did learn enough, and so did De Niro, learn enough Osage to speak the language. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, because there are no subtitles, you're hearing a different language and mm. you know exactly what's going on yeah. in the scene. So Marty said, we don't need to, I don't want to put subtitles in there. Yeah. So there were all kinds of unusual things we did in this movie that seemed to be working. I mean, it's amazing. People really are responding to it and the word of mouth is very good. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a very unusual film and it's long overdue that we opened the door on what we did to the Native Americans in, yeah. in America. They That was all their land, you know. Yeah. That entire... America was their land, and we took it away from them yeah. with no qualms at all. So the Osage themselves, the leaders who saw the movie and really responded to it, said, you're opening the door for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's much more news now about American Indians and uh, the, the Native Americans, the Osage Nation, yes. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Then, well, thank you so much for your time, thank you. And there we go. What a dream to chat to the legend, 83 years old and still editing incredible movies. The Killers of the Flower Moon is absolutely one of the best films I've seen this year. And do you know what? I'd class it as a horror film. I know Thelma there likes to think that she's never made a horror film or never seen a horror film, <laughs> apparently. But I've been pretty horrified by quite a lot of her and Scorsese's movies. So there you go. What an absolute treat to get to chat to her. Uh, and don't forget, Peeping Tom 4K Restoration is out this weekend in cinemas. And there is also a beautiful new 4K Blu-ray release for you to order and get your hands on right now. It's such a stunning film. It's such an important film. Give it another watch for this spooky season. Thank you so much for listening and join us again soon for another episode of The Evolution of Horror. 